Chapter 12. The Oystery. The sun had risen by the time Ellie had worked up the resolve to prod Seth's shoulder. He looked so peaceful asleep and she felt so guilty for waking him with such bad news. I think Finn's going to try and kill you today. Seth blinked rapidly and eased himself up. What? Why? He thinks you're putting me in danger. Seth massaged his temples. So then why did he save my life in the first place? Look, I told you, he's bad-tempered and he gets these ideas. If he says he wants to kill you, then he's certainly going to try. But why does he care about me? Why does he care about you? Ellie grimaced. It's complicated. He doesn't have many friends, so he gets kind of, uh, territorial. As long as you stay here with me, in the workshop, then he can't do anything without risking my safety. But we need to be ready to defend ourselves. Seth gave her a rebellious look. He's a genius, Seth. You should be afraid of him. Seth wrinkled his nose. Fine, he said bitterly. You have weird friends, though. Ellie sighed. I know. Right, we should still take some precautions. Finn might tip off the Inquisitors that you're here, so we'll need a way to escape the workshop. I've got an idea for some hidden traps. There was a knock at the door and Seth snuck down to the basement to hide. Ellie opened the door and found Anna standing outside, looking as if she'd rather be anywhere else. Ellie was surprised by the leap of happiness in her chest. Anna, I didn't think you'd be coming today. Anna shrugged. Someone needs to make sure he doesn't get you killed, she said, gesturing at Seth, who had reappeared at the sound of Anna's name. Good morning, Anna, said Seth cheerily. Ugh, said Anna, blowing a curl of ginger hair aside. Ellie, it's the Magnus Alderdile Festival today, down in the markets of the Unknown Saint. Let's go to it. The whale boy can stay here and play with the furnace or something. Oh, um, said Ellie, flustered. She looked around and spied a broken oyster catcher. I've got to fix that this morning, she lied. The owner wants it finished by noon. Oh, all right, said Anna, shrugging. I'll stay and help you then. Oh, no, said Ellie hurriedly. You'll have to more fun at the market. But I want to help, said Anna, a frown forming on her brow. It's fine, really, said Ellie. Seth can help me. Anna's face fell. Seth drew in air through his teeth. Well, I guess you don't need me at all then, said Anna, and she spun round furiously and stormed out of the workshop. Ellie noticed the look Seth gave her. I don't want her involved, she explained. It's too dangerous. I think Anna can take care of herself, said Seth. Come on, said Ellie, let's get to work. After an hour spent pulling nails out of the floorboards and attaching hinges so they could make the boards fall inwards, Ellie thought she heard a very faint jingling in the street. Um, I'm just popping over to the orphanage to talk to Anna, she said, checking that Seth was busily engrossed with the floorboards. She stepped out of the workshop and closed the door quickly behind her. Finn was leaning against a wall, chin resting lazily on one fist. Go away, she hissed. He's not coming out. Finn chewed his lip in disappointment. Fine, he said, scowling. You win, unless... Ellie's heart quickened. Unless what? Finn's scowl softened, then vanished. Unless I change my plans. I think I need to remind you which one of us is cleverer. Ellie pressed her thumb through the hole in her coat sleeve. Finn, you can't do anything. He's safe in here with me. I know that, said Finn, but she isn't. He smiled an angelic smile, then darted round the corner. Sharp pricks of worry stabbed at Ellie's skin. Anna! She rushed across the street and into the orphanage. She checked Anna's bedroom, the kitchens and the storage room where the forgotten possessions of past orphans were piled to the ceiling. Anna wasn't in any of them. Fry and Ibnett were lounging on the floor of the games room. Where's Anna? Ellie asked them. She's out, said Ibnett. Where? They're having a festival for the anniversary of the 17th vessel's execution, said Fry, holding out a pouch for Ellie to see. Look, Ellie, Anna's been teaching me to pick pockets. This is Ibnett's purse. I stole it from him and he didn't even realise. Ibnett leapt across the room to wrestle his money away from her. 
but Ellie turned and raced back to the workshop. Anna's not in the orphanage, she told Seth. I think Finn's going to try and do something to her. Her heart was firing like a cannon in her chest. I'm going to go and find her. You stay here, Seth muttered moodily. Yes, I know. The markets of the unknown saint were right in the southern edge of the city, on the immutable waterfront. They spilled through a dozen streets and many more alleyways, scores of stalls and hundreds of shoppers. D Ellie had to duck and weave between them, eyes darting around for any sign of Anna. She came to an open square where a hungry, raging bonfire had been built for the celebration. But the people standing round it looked glum, the children waving their streamers half-heartedly. Ellie guessed it was hard to celebrate the anniversary of a ve an old vessel being killed when a new vessel was loose in the city. On the corner of the square, Ellie passed another massive, sturdy-looking building that she'd always thought abandoned. It had boarded-up windows, a spiked roof, a shiny silver lock on its front door. As she watched, an inquisitor pulled along a small man bound in chains. He hurled him inside the building, then went in after, slamming the door behind him. Ellie leaned against a jewellery stall to catch her breath, looking around anxiously for a bright shock of ginger hair or a familiar blue jumper. Hey, watch what you're touching, shrieked the stall owner. Three burly men hurried by, carrying crates of eels, and another elderly shopkeeper yelled at her to buy a wooden engraving of the enemy. Burn it in a bonfire! He screeched, banish the enemy for only 20 pennies. Ellie rubbed the sides of her head and tried to think about Anna. Where would she have gone? The market stalls only sold things like earrings and fish and wouldn't interest Anna. And there were very few sailors for her to pester here, so far from the docks. Think, 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 Ellie told herself. What was the most reckless, dangerous thing someone could do near the immutable waterfront? The oystery, she cried. Anna loved it there. It combined so many of her favourite things. A perilous 300-foot drop, seagulls to spit cherry stones at, and grizzled old fishermen who could teach her new swear words. Ellie broke into a run, darting between a group of musicians and four children flinging sardines at each other. As she got nearer to the seafront, an enormous tower reared up, far taller than the buildings around it. It was called the Tower of the Serpent. It had once been used as a lighthouse, a beacon fire lit on top of it every night. Winding in a spiral round the outside was the vast, graven figure of the sea serpent that gave the building its name, so large that a stairwell ran up its insides. Ellie's mum had often taken Ellie and her brother to the top of the tower when they were little. When her brother had got scared of being up so high, her mother had bundled them up and sung to them. On a better day, the sight of the tower would have made Ellie feel safe and warm. Anna, she cried, turning her head wildly. Anna! Ellie burst out of an alleyway and the sea exploded into view, the sound of crashing waves filling her ears. The immutable waterfront didn't slope smoothly to join the water, but fell sharply into the sea, a cliff made from a hundred submerged buildings. Every day when the tide went down, the walls of these buildings were covered in thousands of oysters. Ellie's mum's oyster catchers could be seen ponderously climbing the walls, gathering up the oysters into a compartment in their bellies. From here, the oysters dropped into a sack, trailing beneath the machine, like a clutch of insect eggs. Stretching out from the walls of the oystery was a sprawling network of wooden walkways and platforms, raised up high above the sea on towering stilts. Connected to each other by ropes and bridges and stairways, Dangling from these platforms on long ropes were hundreds of cages for catching the lobsters and crayfish that swarmed over the rooftops beneath the sea. Fishermen winced the lobster traps back up from the water and carried cagefuls of shellfish back to the city. Some even lived in huts on the platforms, their washing lines tangled with the bunch of mussels that clung to the wooden stilts. And there, sitting on the edge of the platform furthest from the city, legs waggling back and forth as she stared glumly out to sea, was Anna. Anna, Ella, Ellie cried, Anna Stonewall. But her voice was drowned out by the wind. She looked up and down the flat streets that wound along the edge of the oystery and saw him instantly, sitting on a bench and idly winding a lock of golden hair around his finger. 
Finn caught Ellie's eye and waved enthusiastically. Anna! Ellie roared. She pulled a flashbang from her pocket and launched it as hard as she could in Anna's direction. Only the wind caught it and it swirled in a graceful loop before plummeting towards the sea. Ellie gritted her teeth and ran along the closest ropes bridge. Wooden planks rattled. Fear stabbed like needles driven into her hands and feet. Anna! Anna! At last, Anna looked over her shoulder and saw Ellie. She scowled, stood up and started walking in the opposite direction. No, no, Anna, come back. It's not safe. But Anna couldn't hear or didn't want to. The wind whipped Ellie's hair painfully against her neck. She ran and her legs nearly plunged through the gap between two planks in the rope bridge. Behind her, someone was shouting, but Ellie only cared about reaching Anna. Go away, Ellie! Anna yelled above the wind, turning to hurl the words in Ellie's direction. Then Anna's eyes went wide as she looked over Ellie's shoulder. Ellie turned and was hit by a cloud of smoke. The oystery was on fire.